You ever feel like your own life, things just seem to be crumbling. Things just crashing down around you. Maybe things just haven't been going your way. Maybe it's your health, and your health is just not what it used to be. That things are just not working the way they used to work. Speaking of not working the way they used to work, how's your car running? Is it working the way that it used to? How are things around your house? You ever take your car into the shop and you feel like you were just there a couple months ago? And then a couple months later, you feel like you're there again, and you just wonder, how much more money can I put into this thing? You feel that way about your house sometimes? Just feel like, how many more repairs can I possibly do? Things around us just seem to be crashing. You know, how are things financially? Are you enjoying this inflation? Are you enjoying paying what we're paying for eggs right now? I mean, what, what more could we say about how life just seems to be crashing down around us? You think the Apostle Paul ever felt like things were just crashing down around him? Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 13 goes on his first missionary journey. This is going to be grand. This is going to be great. I'm going to go out and preach the gospel to people who have never heard it. He gets to the city of Lystra and they stone him, drag him out of the city, leave him for dead. Well, that's okay. We'll go on a second missionary journey. Second one is going to be okay. Nothing bad is going to happen. Goes on the second missionary journey. Persecuted in city after city and run off uh, and and run out of town. Third time's a charm, right? I mean, he's just getting things rolling. Third missionary journey. Everything's going to be okay. No problems. He gets to the city of Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. There's a violent, riotous mob. Uh, that breaks out, runs into the theater. Paul wants to go in there, and the brethren say, no, 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 you, you, you can't go in there. And they, they get him out of town. He finally gets to the city of Jerusalem, and he's not there for a week, and he's arrested and thrown in prison. You ever feel like Paul may have thought the world was crashing down around him? You know, before he ever ended up in prison in Acts chapter 21, he had already written the book of 2 Corinthians. He wrote the book of 2 Corinthians around Acts chapter 20 and verse 1. And he had already talked about the fact that he had been beaten five times by the Jews. They they beat individuals with 39 stripes. He says, I've already been beaten five times that way. Three times, he said, I've been beaten by the Romans. They don't have any limitations on how many times, how many stripes they inflict on somebody. Talked about the fact that three times he had been shipwrecked. And this is before he's ever arrested in Acts chapter 21. Do you think that Paul ever thought that things were crashing down around him? Arrested, thrown in prison. Acts chapter 23, he's transported by night because his life is in danger. Transported by night to the city of Caesarea where he's going to spend the next two years of his life because there's two governors who don't have a spine enough to release him when he has nothing by which to be held. In Acts chapter 27, he's still a prisoner. And in Acts chapter 27, they decide, all right, we're going to transport these prisoners from here in Caesarea, and we're going to send them to Rome. Things couldn't get any worse for the Apostle Paul, right? I want to invite you tonight to open your Bible to Acts chapter 27. If you think that things are crashing down around you, put yourself into the life of the Apostle Paul. How much more could he endure? How much more could happen to him? How much worse could it possibly get? He's put on a ship as a prisoner in Acts chapter 27. And thankfully, there there are those uh, like Julius that we read about in Acts chapter 27 and verse 3. uh, These individuals, these centurions who are in charge of the soldiers, who have a, a, a level of trust, a level of knowledge, about the Apostle Paul, and so they give him a little bit of freedom, and yet he is still a prisoner here. And in Acts chapter 27, you know what happens here, but I want you to see just how bad things are in Acts chapter 27. They set sail on the Mediterranean. You're reading in Acts chapter 27 and verse 4, we put to sea from there. We sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. You read that in verse 4, and you think, okay, things are not going to go very well. The winds our contrary, to look down in verse 7. We sailed slowly many days. We arrived with difficulty. That's never a good thing. We arrived with difficulty off of Snedis, and the wind was not permitting us to proceed. Look down in verse 8. Passing it, how'd they get past Crete? They passed it with 
difficulty. The sailing, that's not what you want to read when you're sailing. Verse 9, when much, time had, when, we, uh, when much time had been spent, sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. So Paul advised them in verse 10, Men, I perceive that this voyage, this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of cargo and of the ship, but also of our lives. Verse 11, nevertheless, centurion was not persuaded by what Paul said, but instead... He listened to the helmsman and the owner. And then down in verse 12, of course, they're going to listen to the majority. Isn't that always a good idea? To listen to the majority of the people and what they're going to say. Verse 14, not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose. The word that's used here for the word tempestuous, uh, tufanikos, is the word that we would get our word typhoon from. You ever been in a typhoon? You ever been out in the Pacific when a typhoon comes through? And not just any old typhoon. They've got a name for this one uh, down in verse 14. Uh, the name of this is, is Yorokilo. It's a northeaster that's described here that's coming through. Wouldn't you like to be out on a ship in the Mediterranean when a typhoon comes through? And so they're trying to sail in verse 15, but the ship was caught, could not head into the wind. And so it was just driven by the wind in verse 15. How would you like to be on this ship? Verse 16. Running under the shelter of an island, we secured the skiff with difficulty. Things are not going well. Verse 17. When they had taken on board, they used cables to undergird the, undergird the ship. How would you like to be on a ship that has to be held together with cables running underneath? Wouldn't that just... What, can you imagine your wife looking over at you and saying, this is not... The, this is not the honeymoon that I had thought it was going to be. They're strapping this ship together to keep it from falling apart. Fearing, middle of verse 17, lest they should run aground, uh, they struck sail. And again, it says at the end of verse 17, that they were driven by the wind. Verse 18, because we were exceedingly, not just a little bit, we were exceedingly tempest-tossed. The next day, they lightened the ship. The third day, verse 19, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. How would you like to be on this ship? When verse 20 says, the sun and the stars did not appear for many days. They had no idea where they were. Not only are they in the middle of the Mediterranean somewhere, in the middle of this storm, they, because they can't see the, the, the sun or the stars, they have no idea where they are. In the middle of verse 20 says, there was no small tempest that beat on us. Put yourself on board that ship. Put yourself on board that ship when verse 21 says that after long abstinence from, from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me, shouldn't have sailed from Crete, and incurred this disaster and loss. Everything was literally crashing down around the Apostle Paul. Things were bad. Things were, things were bad in the past. They were presently still pretty bad. And notice what Paul says. They are not going to get any better. Look in verse 26 when he says, however, however, he says, we must run aground. That's never a good thing to hear when you're on a ship. We must run aground on a certain island. How would you be feeling right about now? Where would your emotions be? What would the natural response be at a time like that? Would the natural response not be in a situation like this just to abandon hope? Look in verse 20, where the Bible says, Neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no uh, small tempest beat upon us, and all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Natural response, isn't it? You're in the middle of this storm. Everything's crashing down around you. Abandon, not ship, abandon hope. This isn't going to end well for us. What would be a natural response? Wouldn't it be natural just to have anguish of heart? Look at what Paul tells him. He tells him this twice. Look at verse 22. He says, I urge you to take heart. They're full of anguish. He says, I urge you to take heart. He says it again when you get down to verse 25. Therefore, take heart, men. They had abandoned hope. They're dealing with anguish of heart. And even Paul himself, when you look in verse 24, even Paul himself is afraid. 
When, Paul, when God tells Paul in verse 24, do not be afraid, the tense that is used there indicates that he had started to be afraid and he's telling him, don't get involved in being afraid. Wouldn't that just be a natural response to what's happening? I want us to spend some time and some verses here. Paul literally is dealing with things crashing down around him. I don't know where you are in your life. Perhaps you've been through some storms. Perhaps right now you're in the midst of some storms. And if you haven't been through any, and if you're not any, in any right now, you know at some point in life, storms are going to come. How do you get through that? How do you deal with that? When everything is crashing down around you, how do you endure as the Apostle Paul did? I want us to see five things that we learned from Paul in Acts chapter 27. The first thing that we need to do as we follow the example of Paul is we learn from this man who endured all of these things and, and, and we see his utter devotion to God in this text. The first thing I want us to see is down in verse 25. Where Paul says to these men who were there on the ship with him, when everything is crashing down around him, when things just don't look good for Paul, Paul says to those who are there, men, take heart. Worry about the things that are transpiring here, for I believe God. I want you to get into Paul's head. I believe God. And he says, I believe God that it will be just exactly as he has said it would be. You know, that God had been telling Paul for years that he was going to go to Rome. I don't suspect that this is the way that Paul thought he was going to get to Rome. But Paul had been told for years, you are going to stand in Rome. You're going to preach in Rome. And so he knows he's going to get there. And so Paul says, I believe God. In the midst of our storms, brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to say, I don't know what else is going to happen, but I believe God. I have absolute confidence in the word and the promises of God. Not, not just that I've heard some things. Not just, well, you know, when I was a kid, I, I used to believe these things. But right now, to have absolute assurance that whatever God has said, I trust His Word, Psalm 119 and verse 42. The word believe here, by the way, in verse 25, is in the present tense. Indicating that it's not, well, I used to believe this. Or at one time I did. But it indicates a constant, ongoing, habitual faith that Paul has in God. Sometimes we get in the midst of our storms and we start having doubts. Wait a minute. You know, why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? And we start questioning God more than we start putting our faith in God. Paul says, I believe God. I believe that it will be exactly as He has told me. And if you believe in God, there's absolutely no reason to stop believing. Paul was saying this long before Journey was ever singing about it. Don't stop believing. Here's the apostle. Does he have, in, in, in a visual way, in, in, in things that are happening around him, does he have any evidence, visually speaking, hu human-wise speaking, have any evidence to believe in God? Can you imagine some of those guys on the ship with him? You believe in who? You believe in God? Then why is all of this happening to us? You remember Gideon? That's what Gideon said in Judges chapter 6. If the Lord's with us, why is all of this happening? Paul says, I know the Lord is with me. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, he himself has said, we saw this verse this morning, he himself has said, I will, how, how often is God going to leave us or forsake us? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Well, what if stuff's looking really bad? What if everything's crashing down around me? Maybe it's in the world, maybe it's in the nation, maybe it's in my own life where things are just are crumbling. Uh, and and I, there was one family 
not long ago that we had in our congregation that they had three funerals within three months. Maybe you've been there. Like, what more could happen here? I believe God. In Numbers chapter 23, the text is not on the screen, but in Numbers chapter 23, and it's, in, it's down in verse 19. I want you to let these words sink into your heart. Where the Bible talks about the assurance that we can have in what God says. Has he said, and will he not do? Has he spoken, and will he, will he not make it good? Think about those words. You open the Bible, and you open your Bible, and you've got all sorts of evidence to prove to you to have faith in God. But sometimes circumstances of life and things start crashing down around us. We, we wonder, how am I going to get through this? Here's how you're going to get through this. I believe God. Has He said it? And if He has said it, don't you know that He's going to do it? Let's follow the footsteps. Let's follow the faith of the Apostle Paul. I believe God. Do you believe God? How strong is your faith in God? You know, you read James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, we, we, we often comment about it. Sometimes we might chuckle about it in James chapter 1 because we look at James 1 and verse 2 and it says, Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials. We think, all right, we're going to count it all joy. I, you know, I'm going to go through various trials, but I don't know that I can count it all joy. How do you count it all joy? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Testing of your what? Your faith. I believe God. How much do you believe God? The more your faith is tested, the more your believing in God is tested, the stronger it becomes. If anyone lacks faith, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally. But when you ask of God, you better ask in faith. No doubting. Don't doubt your God. Paul didn't doubt his God. He knew God was there. Number two, back up two verses in Acts chapter 27. You back up two verses and see as Paul begins talking to these men about the things that they are encountering, he, he tries to assure them. He tells them in verse 22, they need to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. And then in verse 23, for there stood by me this night an angel, uh, an angel of who? What does your Bible say? An angel of a God? Is that what your Bible says? An angel of God, that would be okay, but it's neither one of those. There has stood by me this night an angel of the God. Which one? The God to whom I belong. I not only believe in God, I belong to God. He's mine. Can you imagine being in the midst of this storm and making that claim? There's been an angel who stood by me this night. Angel of the God to whom I belong. Paul, wait a minute. If you belong to God, why isn't your God doing something about it? Paul was not ashamed to tell all of these people on board this ship who he belonged to. Are we? Things happen in our lives. Are we ashamed to let people know to whom we belong? Paul would say in 2 Timothy chapter 1 in this last letter that he would write, Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed in the middle of the verse, verse 12. For I know whom I have, the first thing we talked about tonight, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that. Don't you love this song? You, you're singing the song in your head, aren't you? I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Paul, what have you committed unto him? Me. I belong to him. And when I belong to God, it doesn't matter what's happening around me. 
because I know the one in whose hands I have placed my life and placed my soul, and I don't belong to me anymore. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I've been bought at a price. I, I, I'm not mine anymore. I belong to the one who paid the price for me. And, and that's, I, I know we know those words. I know we can even quote the verses. But Paul let that get into his soul. Not mine anymore. Here I am in the midst of this storm. I believe God is going to be exactly as he said. And maybe I can't see it with my eyes, but that's okay. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Paul says, I belong to this God and I, 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 I believe in him with all of my heart. And I'm going to take refuge in him no matter what's happening around me. Can, can, I, can I encourage you to turn your Bible back to Deuteronomy chapter 33? And this text that's on the screen. And, and there's, there's a whole context here that, that, that's just that's fascinating. Something that, that would be great if we could look at more verses than this. But I just want to, I want to zone in on some verses here. And think about Moses. These are his final words. This is Deuteronomy chapter 33. Moses is going to walk up in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and he's going to die. And so here, here's, these are his, the book of Deuteronomy are his final sermons to, to his Jewish friends and his Jewish family. Think about what Moses had been through. Think about where he is right now. Moses is not sick. He's not dying at, from any physical ailment. Yet he's not going to get to see the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 22. As you begin reading, let, let's just start, let's look in verse 26. Where Moses wants these Jews to remember. There is no one like the God. Another name for Israel. There's no one like our God. Do you believe that? Nobody like our God. I love what verse who rides the heavens to help you. How long does it take God to get to you? When you say, Lord, please help me. How long does it take God to get to you? When, when Peter began to sink in the waters of the Sea of Galilee, how long did it take Jesus to get to him? Did Jesus have to start running? Did he have to go into a jog to get there? He began to sink. And Peter, Peter prays that shortest prayer. Lord, please save me. What's the next word in your Bible? immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. That's your God. No matter what's happening in your life, and I love that con this idea of Paul being in the midst of the storm, and God rides the heavens to help you in the excellency of the clouds. Look at verse 27. The eternal God is your refuge. Israel, don't forget to whom you belong. Don't forget who got you here. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. What does that mean? What is it? When you, when you hear about the, the, you know, these, these anthropomorphic expressions, talking about God having eyes and God, and God lending his ear and God having arms, you think about God having arms, what does it mean that God has everlasting arms. Does that mean that his arms are really long? They're, they're like infinitely long arms? What does it mean that he has everlasting arms? You ever been carrying a kid for a long time and you thought your arm was going to fall off? I mean, you, you've been carrying that kid all along and your, 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 you, your arm is just killing you. And so what do you do? You switch to the other arm. Give this arm a break and you switch to the other arm. You, you, carry, you carry the child in this other arm for a while until what? That arm begins to feel like it's going to fall off. We, we had two, well, we have two girls. We had two girls and the, uh, they were 14 months apart. And uh, so they were close in age, but our oldest was, was tiny for her age growing up. And so they reached a stage where they were both basically the same size. They wore the same clothes. They were the same size. I can remember carrying both of them 
in my arms and just feeling like I was going to die after a while trying to carry two kids. God has everlasting arms. He never gets tired of carrying you. His arms never weary of picking you up when you're there saying, pick me up, pick me up, I need you like those little kids do. And you say that to God and He never wearies of picking you up and carrying you. Paul's in the midst of a storm. Have you been there? You ever feel like things are crashing down around you? Take refuge in the everlasting arms of God that never get weary of holding on to you and caring for you. Is that your God? Do you have that God that in the midst of a storm you can unashamedly say, that's, that's the one, I believe in God. That's my God, I belong to God. By the way, the word belong in verse 23, it's also a present tense verb. Not just, I used to belong to him until he turned his back on me. I belong to him right now, and I will continue to belong. It's a continuous verb. Go back to Acts chapter 27. Go back to Acts chapter 27 and verse 23. And see that Paul not only says, I believe God. Notice that he doesn't say, I believe in God in verse 25. It's not just, oh yeah, I believe in God. No, 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 I believe God. I belong, verse 23, to God. Now look at the rest of verse 23. When he talks about this God, that this angel of the God appeared to him, the God to whom I belong and the God whom I serve. Whom I what? Whom I serve. Guess what? Another present tense verb. Not the God I used to serve before I got arrested and put in prison. Paul had been a prisoner for, for over two years in, in, in Caesarea and, and in Jerusalem. And now he's a prisoner on a ship in the midst of the, uh, of the Mediterranean Sea on his way to remain a prisoner in Rome. And did Paul take a break? No. The God that I am right now, even in the midst of this storm, even as a prisoner, the God that I am still serving. What's Paul saying? When everything's crashing down around me, guess what? I still busy myself in serving God. I know it is so easy when things are falling down around us and things are, it just think, doesn't look like things could get any worse. It is so easy to look inward. It is so easy to focus on self and my problems and what I'm going through and to even have the idea of looking outward outward at others and what they might need and in certain that those thoughts don't even hardly come to mind it's all about what i am going through what's paul say this one whom i serve paul said my relationship with my god is not bound up in what i get from my god are we ever that way is our relationship with god about what i receive I'm afraid sometimes we get to that point. And so we might reach that, what has God done for me lately? Hello. Let's go sit down and answer that question honestly. What has God done for me lately? But how often is our relationship about what God is doing for me? And here in the midst of this storm, Paul's not saying, what is God doing for me? Paul is saying, here's what I'm doing for my God. When Joshua is ready to die, you remember what he says. Choose you this day whom you will, what does he say? Serve. Not choose you this day which God you're going to get freebies from. No. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to challenge you. Maybe you've been through a storm of life. Maybe you're in one now. No doubt we will all face one at some point in our future. I want to challenge you when you are there to look outward from yourself. It's hard. But to look outward from yourself and to say, what can I do to serve my God? What can I do? What I can do to serve my God 
is to serve others. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40? When, when, when the idea at the judgment scene was, wait a minute, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and, and feed you? When did, we, when did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When, when, when did all of that happen? As much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. I want to challenge you. The next time you're in some kind of a storm like the Apostle Paul is facing here and you think, I don't know that things can get any worse, I want to challenge you to look out from yourself. Look for an opportunity to do unto others. And as hard as that is, guess what it does? It takes your attention off of the storm. And it puts your attention somewhere else. In Acts chapter 27, verse 23, Paul's attention was not on the storm. Remember Peter? Matthew chapter 14, did Peter know there was a storm when he got out of the boat? He knew there was a storm. He had been in it all the while. But he wasn't focused on the storm when he first got out of the boat. But then when he did focus on the storm, you know the rest of that story. Is it possible to be in the midst of a storm but not focus on the storm? But to see what can I do for others? Maybe you've experienced this. I experience it most every time I visit somebody in the hospital. I'll go see one of our members who's in the hospital, one of our members who's in rehab somewhere, and I'll walk in, and in the midst of the conversation that I'm having with this person who's laying in a hospital bed, guess what they do? They do the same thing that happens when I call somebody up on the phone. One of our members who's been sick for a while, I just wanted to check on you. I mentioned this morning about our 92-year-old member who's got stage 4 cancer and it has less than six months to live. And every time I call her, I called her, um, well, I don't remember, sometime in the last week. Every time I called her, still call her, you know what she's always doing? Same thing that person laying in the hospital bed always asked me. How's so-and-so down at church doing? How's so-and-so doing i i called sister so and so just a while back to check on her and i walk out of that hospital room thinking here's this person laying on their back in a hospital bed and who are they concerned about brother so and so who are they asking me about sister so and what are they doing they're making phone calls to check on shouldn't they be concerned about themselves shouldn't they be yes and they are but what are they doing looking out from themselves and trying to make a difference in the lives of somebody. Can we do that? Everything's crashing down around me. I believe God is going to be exactly what he said. I belong to God. I busy myself for God even when things aren't looking good for me. I busy myself for God. You still in Acts chapter 27? Back up, back up to verse 24. When Paul says... In verse 23, this angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, he appeared to me. What does this angel say to him in verse 24? Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. Oh, yeah, angel, you're not in this storm for 14 days. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. That promise had been made. God was keeping that promise. And then this interesting expression at the end of the verse. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Do what? You're going to appear before Caesar. And God has gifted, God has granted, God has given to you those who are on this ship. Paul, nothing is going to happen to these men on this ship and nothing is going to happen to you. I'm in the midst of things crashing down around me and I need to be able to say, I'm blessed by God. When upon life's billows, you are what? Tempest tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking what? All is lost. What does the song say? Count your many blessings. Oh, I don't know that I can do it then. 
Paul, that's what this angel is telling you to do. This angel is coming down and this angel is telling you, God has heard your prayers. Do we need to be reminded of that? Even in the midst of my storms, God hears my prayers. I have that guarantee. I have that confidence is the word in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. We have this confidence that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then we know, not we think, we hope, we wish, we know that we have the petitions that, he, that we ask of Him. Do we know that? I'm blessed by God. And even in the midst of the storm, I need to be able to count my blessings and to see that everything that I have has been given to me by my God. Every good and perfect gift doesn't come from Amazon. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Comes from my God. Everything I have. And even when things don't seem to be going well, count your many blessings. Make a list. I don't know if you are one who who keeps a a thanksgiving, a thankful journal. But when I have members who come and say, I'm just going through this, I don't know how I'm going to get through all of this. You know, things just seem to be getting worse and worse. One of the things sometimes I'll talk to them about is, how about you keep a journal? And just find three things every day that you can be thankful for. Just three. But the next day, I want you to find three different ones, not the same ones you found the day before. Just three. And when you're ready, make it five. You know what that does? Boy, that changes your perspective on things. Do we know that in in, in Romans chapter 8, when God says that God did not spare His own Son, when it came time to save us from our sins, God gave the very best. And if God did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, shall He not then freely give us what? All things? If God's already given us the best that He has of heaven, what is there left that He's not going to give to us? Even in the midst of what we're going through, Paul says, I'm blessed by God. God is taking care of me, and He's granted these men who are there. He's granted me my own life. Can we do that? Turn turn for just a minute over to Psalm 34, and then we're going to come back and finish Acts chapter 27. But even in the midst of troubles, even in the midst of trials and storms, can we not look and see the blessings of God? I want you to see just a few expressions here in Psalm 34. Psalm begins by saying, I will bless the Lord. How often? In your Bible, Psalm 34 and verse 1. I will bless the Lord when the times are going good. When things are going good, that's when I'll bless the Lord. Is that what he says in Psalm 34 and verse 1? I will bless the Lord at all times. Ooh, can I do that? At all times. Verse 4, I sought, I'm looking, my eyes are open. I sought the Lord and He heard me. He delivered me from, what did He deliver me from in verse 4? Some of my fears. You got the word all circled in your Bible? He delivered me from all of my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried out in verse 6 and the Lord heard him. Saved him out of his troubles. Verse 7 is one of my favorite in all the Bible. The angel of the Lord. What, pre, what, what, what tense is the verb here? The angel of the Lord used to encamp in the Old Testament, but he doesn't anymore. Or the angel of the Lord, he will in the future. No, it's present tense. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. I am, I am blessed by God. Verse 8, oh, taste and see. We keep seeing this idea of looking Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Drop down to verse, I don't know, I want to look at all of these. You see the word seek again in verse 10. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Drop down to verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Even in the midst of storms, His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord, it's against those who do evil. We need to remember that, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. 
The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears. And He delivers them out of what? Some troubles? You got the word all again, circled? He delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near, not far. He's near to those who have a broken heart, and He saves those who have a contrite spirit. Verse 19, final verse here. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Well, thanks a lot, Lord. Thanks a lot. Many, is God, is he, is he not telling us, does He not share with us, many are the afflictions of the righteous. What's the next word you have in your Bible? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, comma. What's the next word you have in your Bible? Is it not a word of contrast? That's the word I've got. I've got the word but. God doesn't put a period. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, exclamation point. No, 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 no. He's not done yet, comma, but the Lord delivers him out of what? Them all. You got it circled? Even in the midst of storms when things are crashing down around us, I'm blessed by God. I just need to look. I need to seek the Lord. I need to taste and see that the Lord is good. I need to count my blessings. One more point I want you to get from Acts chapter 27. Let's go back there real quick. Acts chapter 27, everything's crashing down around Paul. What does he say? I believe God. I belong to God. I busy myself for God. I'm blessed by God. Now, get down almost to the end. And as Paul is trying to encourage these men, some of them try to escape in verse 30, try to get out of the ship. And he says in verse 31, not going to happen. Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes. They let the skiff go. Verse 33, Paul says, Today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food. How long could you go without food? You ever eaten nothing for 14 days? I suppose if you were out on a ship, you might not eat anything unless you get seasick. Therefore, I urge you, verse 34, I urge you to take nourishment for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fail, not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And here's what I want us to see in verse 35. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. When I'm in the midst of my storms, I need to bow down and bless God. I don't know if it struck any of these folks weird or not. Here's the Apostle Paul, and he's talking to them, and before he eats, he gives thanks to God. Well, why hasn't his God taken care of him? You can imagine everybody's skepticism, and yet Paul, even in the midst of this storm, bows down to God, blesses his God, and in verse 35, gives thanks to God in the presence of them all. I do not need to allow the, light, the difficulties that I have in my life to hinder my praise of God. We're not going to take time to go over and look at these passages. Psalm 42 is one of, the, is one of my favorites when it talks about, here's man in all of his trials, and yet I come out of that and I still praise my God. I still give thanks to my God even when things don't seem to be going my way. I still bow down. I still bless my God. Do I not have, even in the midst of, of trials and difficulties in life, do I not have extraordinary reason to give thanks to God? Psalm 103, and you drop down to verse 2. It's, uh, verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits towards me. Yeah, but look at all this bad stuff happened to me. Forget not all of his benefits towards me. Ephesians 5 and verse 20. Giving thanks to God always in all things. I bow down and I bless my God. Realizing that what I'm doing can have an influence on others. Look at the very next verse in Acts 27. Then they were all encouraged and took food themselves. Paul and his faith, Paul and his thanksgiving to God, even in the midst of what was happening, 
had a positive impact on the rest of these people that were on that ship. It may be that somebody's looking at you. It may be that somebody is looking at what you're going through and wondering how are they going to get through this. A few years ago, a few years ago, my wife's sister and two of her wife's, my wife's sister's daughters, so my, so my sister-in-law and her two daughters perished in a house fire in Henderson, Tennessee. So my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, lost their youngest daughter and lost two of their granddaughters in a house fire. How are they going to handle that? When you have a funeral that has three caskets up at the front of the church building, that's not very common. Three hearses parked out in the parking lot. Very unusual. When we went back a few months later to visit my wife's parents, the folks at the Henderson Church came up to talk to Tracy and I. Obviously to continue expressing sympathy to Tracy and to hug her and care for her. But one after another of those people who came to talk to us at the church said, I want to tell you how encouraging your parents have been to us through all of this. <laughs> we were wanting the church family to be encouraging to Tracy's mom and dad through all of this because we're a thousand miles away and we couldn't be there the whole time. But when we get back there a few weeks later, what's the church telling us? We've been amazed by their faith. And they have been such an encouragement to us <laughs> through all of this. How you handle trials will have an impact on everybody else around you. You feel like things are crashing down around you? May I plead with you to have the heart of the Apostle Paul. Everything was literally crashing down around him. He says it doesn't matter. I believe God. I belong to God. I'm not going to sit back and just let God do for me. I'm going to busy myself in serving God. Because I'm blessed by this God even in the midst of the storm. And so I'm going to continue to bow down and bless my God. I love Acts chapter 27. And I love the faith that we see there. I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what you've been through. Some of you shared with me at lunch today some things that you've been through and my heart breaks to see trials that families go through. And yet no matter what you're going through, may God help us to react in this way. Paul said, an angel of the God to whom I belong appeared to me. Do you belong to that God? Is he yours? Can you say that with confidence like the Apostle Paul did? The God to whom I belong. You can only say that if you've done what the New Testament teaches us to do. To get into a right relationship with God. It starts with faith. It starts with believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, those who believe have a right to become a child of God. You're not there yet, but you've got the right to become a child of God if you believe that He's the Son of God. What does God call us to do? It's what we talked about this morning about repentance. About making up my mind that I need to change. It's a change of mind. It leads to a change of life and a change of action. Are you ready to make that decision today? Don't you want it to belong to the God that the Apostle Paul served? Make up your mind. You're done serving self. I'm ready to serve Jesus. And if you're ready to do that tonight, you can do what they did in the New Testament to become a Christian. You can confess the faith that is in your heart. And this very night, you can do what Blake did this morning. You can be baptized into Christ so that at that moment, not before, so that at that moment, the blood of Jesus might wash away every sin you've ever committed. 
the God of heaven, might add you to his church. You don't join the church of the Bible. You're added by God to that church. And when you're added to, but to that church, he enrolls your name in heaven, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. And now you belong to God. And he calls upon you to serve him faithfully, even in the midst of storms. Where are you today? Do you belong to him? Is he yours? If you need to get your life right with him, why don't you do it right now? As together we stand and sing.